This is a production of Gordon College's Scott Radio. Scott Radio. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to the Photo Finish, Scott Radio's home for motorsports. I'm your host, Ben Schneider. And with me in the studio tonight, once again, is Chase Strauss, host of The End here on Scott Radio, among other things, the marketing director. Congratulations on that role. Uh, I mean, I wasn't going to go for the marketing director, because honestly... <laughs> I can't count how many fi- times I've made fun of the directors, and now I'm one of them, and I'm like, this is like a whole new level of self-loathing, so I'm not sure how to handle that. <laughs> well, you're certainly doing a good job. I yeah, think, to, I, to I appreciate that, man. Year. I appreciate yeah. that. So, dude, so, um, all right, I know you've been advertising this a little bit, so I got to ask, so you went to Nazareth. Um, I did. I ex- explain that for the people who don't know, because I got a couple people listening right now who have no idea what Nazareth is. Yeah. They think that's, you know, Jesus, where Jesus was born. Well, yeah, so. no, not... Uh, Nazareth, comma, Pennsylvania, not Nazareth, comma, Jesus of. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I went. I live in Delaware, so I went home for the weekend. Uh, just been a bit of a rough, long week. Uh, wanted to see my family, so I went back home. And for a long time, I've been thinking, you know, if I just, if I swing out a little bit west, I usually take the Jersey Turnpike, um, I can pass through Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And... Those of you who maybe don't know, there's an old abandoned racetrack out there, Nazareth Speedway. It opened way back in 1910. Uh, it's been a dirt track and most recently a paved asphalt track about a mile long. And up until 2004, as recently as 2004, was hosting races for the IndyCar series, the IRL, which uh, predated that, and the Bush series and Craftsman Truck series for NASCAR. So after 2004, the Speedway closed. They removed the catch fence and the grandstands. Some of the grandstands, I think, were actually shipped off to uh, Watkins Glen, where they are still to this day. And the racetrack was basically left to just sit there and rot away and let nature consume it. And it's a very sad story for race fans, particularly in the area, and also particularly because Mario Andretti arguably the greatest racing driver ever, is literally from Nazareth. Uh, He was born in Italy, but when his family came over to the United States when he was a teenager, they settled in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. So the track is literally in his backyard, and yet it's not a racetrack anymore. It's, It's literally gone. The site was purchased in 2015, uh, but obviously the new owners have not been very, uh, motivated to do anything with the place but yeah i just wanted i want to tell you guys a story of uh why i decided to go there and what i found when when i ended up so did you ever did you ever watch a race that took place at nazareth no i was uh, first i mean cars is really what got me into the sport um that came out in 2006 so by the time i was into the sport and and even if i had i don't think i can't remember watching much of anything (laughs) what when i was five years old i mean dora maybe but like yeah in terms of sporting events um, so yeah, I never, I never got to see a race there live, but I did, I played some, uh, the EA video games for, uh, for NASCAR. They kept Nazareth in, after the track closed, they considered Nazareth a fantasy track, uh, but they still included Nazareth in the, uh, in the NASCAR video games. So I was definitely familiar with the track and I've seen, I've watched old races on YouTube and, and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I've also watched, uh, I'm not the first guy to do this, uh, people, in recent years going to the Speedway to see what's still there and uh, kind of pay their respects to it. Um, so I was in Allentown or just outside of Allentown. I was stopping to, to get gas and uh, snacks and stuff. Um, so I plugged Nazareth Speedway into Google Maps and it pops up with a message saying, Nazareth Speedway may be permanently closed. <laughs> and I was no. like... <laughs> really? Yeah. It, you, you don't say Google Maps, um, but well, anyway. I mean, since when has Google ever been the brightest well, bulb in the shed? But, that's, uh, that's, that's fair. That's something for my show, uh, yeah. shameless plug. Um, obviously, there's a lot of history with this track, and um, so you actually tweeted some stuff and out, some stuff out, and uh, you may or may not have gotten one of the most influential racers of all time to uh, respond. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> I want to I want to tell the story of, of right, right, me being at the track bad, first. No, you're no, you're fine. So. I got to, so Google Maps was taking me on their route, and I end up passing through the uh, walkway towards uh, 
a giant food store, a supermarket, mm-hmm. and I knew I was on the right track because in the Wikipedia article, it actually says that the old dirt track is actually, when Roger Penske bought the track in 1986, the old section of the property was sold to a grocery store chain, and that's where the giant store is today. Um, so I knew that the racetrack was right up the hill uh, behind it. But I didn't see a clear entrance to it. I just saw a field and, and a fence. So I figured I'd go down the road a little bit, make a left, and uh, see if I could get into one of the old actual gates and entrances. Um, so I found two. I found gate three and gate four, and they were both fenced off and locked and supposedly secure. <laughs> um, supposedly. Suppose, yeah. Uh, supposedly, uh, again, if you go to Wikipedia, usual caveats there if you're doing research and everything, but... It says access to the track is today is strictly uh, prohibited and restricted to the public. <laughs> but there are holes in the fence, and I keep telling people trespassing laws are vague at best and non-existent at worst. So if you want to know, was I trespassing by doing this, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> technically, I guess, but at the same time, at clearly— least put, At least put up a challenge. Yeah, like. <laughs> there's, no, there's no security— uh, there's no, there's yeah, no, there's, there's no cameras. There's, there's none. There's, there's none of that. There's holes in the fence. Like you, yeah. Like I'm pretty and sure it's a not blind like, person could break into this. Yeah. No problem. Like it's not it's, that hard. Yeah, it's not like I was, you know, going to set the place on fire or anything like that. Which, by the way, a couple of eighth graders actually tried to do um, earlier oh, this year. Oh, the rambunctious but, youth of today trying yeah. to destroy history. Well, I mean, well, shocker. But yeah. Anyway, um, so obviously yeah. there's a lot of history with this track, and I'm interrupting your story again, but. Do you have a particular, like, when you walked into this, you know, racetrack, what was kind of the atmosphere that you really felt? Because, I mean, like, obviously with Nazareth, there's a lot of history behind it. So, like, you know, yeah. could you kind of feel it? Well, like, it's particular, it was particularly emotional for me. Um, I was a Dan Weldon fan, and actually tomorrow is the eighth anniversary of his death. And the last, it wasn't just the last IndyCar race there, the last race ever at Nazareth was an IndyCar race uh, in August of 04, and the winner was Dan Weldon. Um, so the fact that he's the last ever guy, almost certainly will be the last ever guy, I don't I don't see racing returning to this place, at least yeah. not any time in the immediate future. Um, and without them practically demolishing it and, and building it up from the ground up, if racing ever does return to the site. But the fact that he's the last guy to ever win there just kind of added to the, the emotional feeling for me. But I, want, I kind of want to tell the story of how I got into the track. Uh, I parked. I ended up not going in either of the gates because I thought, well, you know, if I park my car in the shoulder and nobody's there, it's going to look kind of suspicious because, like, I'm not going in here for 10 minutes. Like, I, w- I want to take a full lap of the track. I want to go into the infield, see what's there. Um, I, I want to have my time to explore. So I went back to the the, uh, the grocery store parking lot, parked in the back of a, of a Dollar General. And the reason I did that was because I was just doing a quick Google search, uh, see blog pieces, other people that have visited. And one guy said that he walked up a hill behind the Dollar General, found a hole in the fence there, and that's how he got in. So I ended up doing the same thing. I went behind the shopping complex. You know, this is incriminating evidence, right? What? (laughs) (laughs) What? I mean... I, I know. What no. are they going to do? I mean, they have no proof. As far as, we're con- as far as they're concerned, we're just a bunch of guys on radio <laughs> telling a story of fantasy and uh, non-incriminating stories. Anyway, continue. It's – I don't think I did anything wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I I walked through the hole. There's a, there's a field of grass. Obviously, grass hasn't been mowed or anything, so it's fairly tall. But it's nothing I can't get through easily. Um, found a window of – overgrowth and trees and shrub and everything that wasn't too bad um so went through that hopped over the concrete wall and there i was standing on the racing surface and it's crazy to me because i look out to my right and i'll if you're watching this after the fact on youtube i know if you're watching live it's just uh, a podcast and radio but or if, you're, if you're listening live rather you're not even watching what am i saying um <laughs> But yeah, I walk out to the track, I look to my right, and I can't see past 50 meters down the down the road. Wow. Because it's just a wall of trees and, and shrub, and it's literally growing out of the cracks in the pavement, and it's been 15 years. And the devastation is is already so massive. 
so I, I look. I, I took a, I took a lap around the track in reverse um, because when I looked out, it didn't look like I was going to be able to go that way uh, with how bad the overgrowth was. Um, but I ended up making it all the way around. Uh, got some good photos of the walls or, or what's left of the paint there, and it's kind of crazy. Uh, the paint from the '90s and early 2000s is so much is so far gone to the point where the stuff in the 80s is actually starting to come back. Wow. So, yeah, it's 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 crazy to think about that. And there's all sorts of graffiti, everything from RIP, NZSP, Rip Nazareth Speedway, which I approve of that, and uh, Let Me Get Boneless Pizza. I don't, I don't know how I feel about <laughs> Someone put, I want boneless pizza on one of the most historic racetracks in the country. I yep. hate the youth today. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that because we're supposed to be welcoming and encouraging, yeah, but at the well, same time, you want boneless pizza. All pizza is boneless. What is wrong? They with even you? got a guy shrugging his shoulders. They they drew that too. Oh my yeah. God. I, 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 but but right next to it is a sign is a, or not a sign graffiti that says the sadness will last forever. Like I can get behind that. You know, that's not that's not terrible. I mean, but. It's it's kind of sad. I'm not gonna lie because, you know, I, uh, unlike you, I actually do remember a race at Nav- Nazareth, and I think it was probably one of the later. I think it was 2004 IndyCar, because my dad sat me down. And he's like, "This is the last time that we can actually ever watch this race happen here, because they're closing down." But, uh, you know, I actually do remember the track, and honestly, like, kind of looking at the pictures, it's just like, it's completely different. So. Yeah. It's kind yeah, of scary well, if you, you know, think about it, but Mario Mario himself went out in uh, late April, and Indy Star did a story in May right before the 500, and he, you know, this is this is Mario Andretti. This isn't just some casual racing fan. This is a guy who lives here. This is a guy who won. He doesn't even know how many races he's won here. He just keep trusts uh, the track to keep track of that for him because um, I mean, <laughs> he was racing there so much. But he's standing in the pit lane. He thought he was on the track. It took him a second to realize, I'm actually in the pits. I'm not on the racing surface. And you can't blame the guy because the overgrowth is so bad. But it's, yeah, the, the track's track's gone. Like, there are people. So, and part of the reason that I got motivated to go this time around uh, was Dale Jr. actually has kind of started a movement on his podcast uh, to go kind of weed North Wilkesboro Speedway, which is another racetrack that's been closed for a few years, hasn't seen a lot of action, um, but is not nearly as far gone as Nazareth is. There's just kind of some weeds and stuff growing out of the pavement. Uh, the track's still salvageable. Like, if they wanted to spend a bunch of money to fix it up, uh, they they could. Uh, it's not, it's not to this point yet. Yeah. So, you know, Junior's not talking about, like, a complete renovation process and everything or GoFundMe to get that started or anything. He just wants to go clear the surface. Um, which shouldn't be too difficult to do. And the reason he wants to do that is so that iRacing, which is a racing simulator, and I, I hesitate to say video game, because if you call iRacing a video game, the people in the iRacing community flip out at you and say, how can you call it a video game? It's it's so much more sophisticated than that. It's it's a real-life simulation <laughs> that I use controls and buttons and joysticks with. Well, to be fair, they, most of them are using uh, legit wheels, like racing wheels, but it, it's still... Pretty much. Anyway. Yeah. It's not... It is it is a game over video by definition, but I digress. That's that's a debate for we could spend a whole hour talking about that. Um, oh, I look forward to it. <laughs> uh, well, well, don't because we're not going to. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, people people saw that, and then somebody tweeted out a petition to say, "Well, hey, I racing while you're doing that, why don't you go scan Nazareth too?" And I just. I kind of laughed and said, I don't think you understand what it means to scan the racetrack. Like, they literally send their whole crew out there to measure every little bump in the asphalt down to the thousandth of an inch, scan the whole surface, get an overhead shot so that they can mimic the the grandstands and everything down to the last inch. There are trees growing out of the pavement. It's not happening. (laughs) If you Mm -hmm. went to scan Nazareth, you would have to drive through the trees. (laughs) 
They're, I mean, I definitely think that would be to offer a much more interesting racing experience, but I don't think that's exactly the racing experience yeah. that iRacing wants. No. I did, if you want to go race Nazareth, go go to the old video games. That's that's your only choice. Yeah. I mean, it's it's something at least, but iRacing, there's nothing they can do there. Every time they scan a track, it's literally like a $100,000 at least endeavor and, that they're taking on. And not even just to mention the fact that it would take you know $100,000 if it was like a fully operational track. To do that, to, you know, do Nazareth, I mean, I think if they really wanted to, they could potentially get the asphalt. I mean, yes, you would have to clear down the trees. However, you could just, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, there's. And even then, like, you, it, you, it would take I don't know, so you, much. I think it would at least cost half a million, though, yeah. to actually I mean, you, do it. You couldn't salvage any of the asphalt, I don't think. It's, it's just too far gone for that. I mean, if anything, it'd be a good point to prove, you know, it's like, yeah, this is what happens, you know, when a racetrack dies, I mean. Yeah, or when, you know, it gives me gives me such a great appreciation for everybody that takes care of, you know, MLB stadiums and NFL fields yeah. and everything. Like, like There's you have to maintain that over the whole offseason. So. I mean, uh, speaking on that, I have a friend of mine who is a the uh, groundskeeper for a prep school, and he maintains the turf field, the track and field, and he maintains the ice rink. He gets pretty close to, like, 60 hours a week. Like, he is by no means a lazy man. Like, he shows up at, you know, 9 a.m., and he doesn't go home till at least 6 every night. It's a lot of work. And, I mean, that's not – like, that's for high school kids. I mean, they have a very good field. They have a very good ice rink. They have a lot of good other things. But it's, like, a professional race track requires so much more thought than people really understand because i mean like yeah. one little pothole that you know most people you know bump over and you know driving down the road huh i think i think i hit a bump or something in nascar that's like oh hey look a uh, bump in the car that took off you know potentially yeah. like they had to, seconds they had to time. they had to delay the daytona 500 in 2010 for that exact reason there was a pothole going in the track and they've spent a long time repairing that and then that that actually was kind of what started the movement to repave daytona when they yeah when through that whole process a few years ago um but yeah back to nazareth i uh doing a lap around the track and then i finally see i tried when i was on the front straightaway and the start finish line i tried i thought to myself well okay if i can get onto the pit lane which i did and then cut through that you know i'll basically be at the care center and the old media center and everything so maybe i can just you know brute force my way through the shrubs and everything but i quickly realized that was not going to happen um <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah, it's well, I mean it's it's that thick and that bad. Um but you got to remember this is the original infield, so you know there was grass down there to begin with. So nature yeah. already had a head start yeah, on, uh, might, on that part of the surface, with but like a machete or a weed whacker or something. Oh yeah. It'd be insane. But... Yeah. Uh, I mean I mean that even that won't take down the, the trees and everything. But I mean if you get the right weed whacker, well, that's uh, another debate. Um yeah. But but yeah, I found the uh so I find the Media center and the infield care center are still standing, or the structure is at least. And there's uh, there are restrooms attached to the to the media center, and the infield care center. Similarly, it's still there, but you take a look inside, and Chase, I'll show you the picture here. I don't know if you saw it when I posted it, but there's old furniture in there that never got removed. The door is propped open, and it is exposed to all the elements, and it's just sitting there to rot away. I mean, it literally looks like, uh, for those of you who are listening right now on uh, Scott Radio's uh, uh, streaming service, it's basically the equivalent of like what would happen if uh, a tornado came through, because all the installation for the ceilings on the floor, um, there are you know heating vents all over the place. Uh, there seems to be like a mattress. It's almost as if a homeless community was living in there, and they just didn't care. Yeah, like, but it, it almost bunch... it almost looks like they started to take it down, but then. Never finished. Because yeah. like you said, the insulation's been pulled out and everything, but it's still standing. So Yeah, it's – I mean, like just looking through some of the pictures, I mean, like the track is definitely – like if you really wanted to restore this track, you could. However, it would cost a lot more money than what it would bring in. Yeah, and you, and you might as well just, I think, blow it up and start all over because it's like – yeah, like you said, it's at what point is gone. it really yeah. even worth it? And it kind of hurts because honestly, I, for 
kind of my weird fact is that I'm actually very strangely a history buff. Like, I love history. Like, honestly, I think the stories that people have, honestly, that's how we learn in today's world. That's how we learn from the mistakes of the past. That's how we make it better tomorrow. But it always makes, it kind of always brings a tear to my eye to see old historical sites, like, especially with sport, you know, really just kind of suffer, like, the way this track is being like treated it's like for me like honestly if i was the uh company that owns it right now i would definitely do like you know at least like some sort of like you know like a yearly thing where it's like all right hey we're gonna just kind of take a loop through the track you know just to kind of honor the people who yeah but yeah even then it's like i mean i'm looking at the uh, wikipedia entry right now and they say there is a there's plans to convert sections to residential and to build a warehouse. And I'm like, dang, like, I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it, but but here's the thing. People, well, there, there are a couple things. First of all, you know, a lot can change in 15 years. So Nazareth as a town is not the same that it was 15 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, you got to factor in, well, the economy's different and, you know, different people are living there now. Like, would could you put a racetrack there? And some people think you can, and... They think you can't to the point where when the site was sold, there was a clause in the contract that specifically stated that racing is banned from returning to the property. And I think, you know, it's kind of unclear, uh, but the guess from most is that that's because Pocono Raceway is so close, which, you know, okay, I get that to an extent, but at the same time, you know, the the Yankees and Mets literally take a subway to get to each other's stadiums. Like, if you can have you can have two baseball stadiums in New York City, you know, why couldn't you have two racetracks in, in that area of Pennsylvania? I mean, especially because this, you know, by the way, like, Pocono and Nazareth are two very different racetracks, you know. Sure, yeah, Nazareth's a mile, Pocono's two and a half. Yeah, so it's like, to ba- outright ban racing, like, that's some footloose stuff right there where it's just like, dude, really? You're going to ban something that this it was literally designed to do it just for me that doesn't make sense so yeah well it's not designed to do it anymore yeah. um i've been telling yeah i've been telling people like you know coach asked me at breakfast on monday morning like i saw you went out to a racetrack and i said well i went out to what's left of one yeah <laughs> it's yeah and I, I just i remember reading that uh i'll put a link in the description of a youtube video to that indie star article you know when when mario's PR reps were being contacted with this idea of bringing him back to visit what's left of the Speedway. Um, one of them basically said, well, Nazareth Speedway doesn't exist. And and I, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, he, he's not wrong. Um, and it's just the, the, the only word I can keep coming back to is eerie. Yeah. Um, the feeling of being there. And it just, it, it did kind of play with my emotions a little bit. Um, and I don't know, I just, I feel like I'm kind of talking in circles here and I could just yeah. ramble on and say the same thing, but, so would you, you know, say words, the... words don't do it justice, you know, and I, I Google the track, I see other people's, you know, vlogs of when, when they went there and the videos they put together, uh, when they visited and, you know, you understand, okay, it's bad, but then like, it's a whole different feeling when you're actually standing there yourself. Yeah. So kind of from what I gathered, you know, like, you used the word eerie when you visited this racetrack. Like, like, did you even, like, like, is it, doesn't even feel like, you know, like, it feels kind of surreal from what you're telling me. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, like, there's also the fact that, you know, I'm the only, I know I'm the only one there. I know I'm alone. Um, I've got the whole property to myself for an hour to just explore and see what's left of it. And... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel like I have, I'd, I'd have to really sit down and contemplate before I could come up with the words to describe. It. I mean, it's only been forty-eight hours since I was out there, so yeah, I'm still trying to process everything that I saw. I'm not gonna lie though, if you saw another person there, probably would be the worst heart attack you've ever had in your <laughs> life. Just you know, walking around through a racetrack, and then oh my goodness! It's just... Well, it would, uh, it would probably just be a crazy coincidence of somebody doing the same thing because. There's there's a place in that uh, shopping center called Speedway Salon mm-hmm. next to that Dollar General. Um, that's the old like if you live if you move there within the last you know ten years or so, that would be your only clue that there's a racetrack in your backyard. Like yeah. they're, they're, all the signs are down, obviously, and uh, 
yeah, it's just a, just a real shame what happened to that place. And there, I don't know. You can point blame at ISC. You can point blame at, uh, you know, whoever you want. But it doesn't, it's not going to bring the track back or anything. So that's my uh, that's my story of Nazareth Speedway going to visit. And then I tweeted some pictures out, put some pictures on Instagram. And I don't want to say it went viral because the tweet only got 87 likes, which in the grand scheme of things is not too much. But it, it went viral within within NASCAR Twitter and racing Twitter. Um got some attention there and I tweeted the photos out and then somebody replied to me and tagged Mario Andretti and said like hey have you seen this and I responded to the tweet and said yes he has he was actually out there himself yeah. just a few months ago and a couple hours later I got a notification saying Mario Andretti liked your tweet <laughs> oh my gosh that's what I was so, kind of linking to earlier. I, you know, I felt like you, you've seen cars, right? The yeah. Pixar, I felt like Fred right before the big race. <laughs> like, you know, so Fred's the old rusty car that, you know, has, you know, he's a crazy super fan and his license plate is literally his name. Yeah. And so, you know, he's trying to get into, he doesn't have a garage pass, but he's trying to get in the infield. And then Mario Andretti, who had a cameo in the movie, this is his only line. He comes up and, of course, he's let in without issue, but he says, uh, good morning to you, Fred. <laughs> and then Fred says, Mario Andretti knows my name. You've got to let me in now. <laughs> yep. So uh, I feel like Mario Andretti at least somewhat knows who I am. He liked my tweet. <laughs> I feel oh like my, my career is at a new high point. Um, I mean, hey, I would kill if, uh, if one of my heroes from ice hockey would retweet one of my tweets. However, right now, all I'm doing is yelling at Max Kellerman on Twitter because <laughs> Max Kellerman is an idiot. Um, <laughs> we've we've spent half the show already telling the story, and and we could we could go on for sure. Yeah. Uh, I have no doubt, but we do have some news and uh, races that we want to get to. So if you want to know more, um, you can contact me, or if you you see me on campus, if you're listening live and you don't know very much about the story i'm happy to share more about the experience with you but or tweet them because twitter yeah and before <laughs> before we even get into races i do have to give a shout out to colleague racing and ross chastain their full-time deal came together today i'm totally not biased i swear oh, but yeah, that's a little uh, bit bias yeah um of course i met ross about a year ago actually when i when i went to dover um he's sponsored but he's got a partnership with Delaware Highway yeah. Safety. So every time they come to Dover, uh, they're on his race car. Hey. But yeah, so uh, they're going to go Xfinity Racing full time next year, uh, unless the FBI raids Nutrien uh, like they did DC Solar, because he was supposed to be full time with Ganassi this year. But then we found out DC Solar was a huge Ponzi scheme, and Warren Buffett lost three hundred forty million dollars on the deal. Fun times. And NASCAR just became interesting <laughs> again. <Yeah>. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. Why 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 did it have to be DC Solar, man? Why <laughs> But that's but that's good news for him and that team. Yeah. So we're excited about that here. All right. Uh K and N West at Roseville. So Jagger Jones, I've got my Jagger Jones shirt on. It just came yeah, in the he mail. Does. It's uh, number six on his yeah. shirt. Sunrise Jagger. Ford. Yep. That's that's such a great name. Jag Jagger Jones, right? Like that, that's it's just kinda like J. Joma Jameson, where it just rolls off <laughs> yeah. the tongue, it's just Jagger Jones. I mean like yeah. The, the grandson of former Indy 500 winner Parnelli Jones, son of former NASCAR and IndyCar driver PJ Jones, now driving in k and West for Sunrise Ford. Finally got his first win. Honestly, probably should have won two or three races this year already. Very nearly won on debut. He was leading on the final lap at the Las Vegas dirt track, got caught up in lap traffic, and Haley Deegan passed him to win that race. Um Haley Deegan herself had a pretty good night. She won the pole, was fast in practice sessions. Uh, she spun out early, uh, ironically, off the bumper of Jagger, I believe. And, you know, I I, I don't condone uh, intentional wrecks. I don't think this wreck was intentional, but regardless. Um, I'm going you know, to take your word for that because I didn't see it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but Haley's been pretty aggressive this year. It's drawn the ire of uh, some race fans, kind of made her a polarizing figure. Um People, I'm still surprised she has People hasn't calling been. her the Intima Deegan after Dale Earnhardt. Um. Haley Deegan is honestly, oh. like, she's, for me, she's going to be that next big racer. Like, everyone's just, like, really, like, the last generation of racing where it was, like, you know, that old school rivalry where it's, like, you know, 
I hate you, I'm going after you. I get that same vibe from Haley Deegan. Like she yeah, will, sure. she well, is ruthless. Yeah, like her So you're still a believer, you say. A believer in Haley Deegan? Yeah. I, I would say so. I think she still has what it takes. Yeah. I think she well, just I needs think, that one break. Yeah, I think it would be great um to see her make it there. Uh whether or not she will, I think is, is a is a whole separate issue. Um but we could go another she, hour yeah. on that one. <laughs> yeah. But she's been She's been good, not great, I feel like, in K&N. Um, and it, it's sounding, you know, there are rumors that she's going to be at least part-time in trucks next year, um, which I think, you know, that's that's the next step. Uh, trucks will work Xfinity on the development ra- ladder. Uh, we'll see what the future holds for her, but again, you know, we, we could we could spend a whole future show on, on Haley Deegan, what we think of all the attention yeah. she's got. And we got into that a little bit last week, and... I'm sure for the next time I have Matt Cole on the show, we're going to talk about that again because he's a big fan. Uh, but despite that spin, you know, obviously she had a fast car. She worked her way back up in second. And Trevor Huddleston was third. Derek Krause finished fourth. And Krause has basically locked the championship up at this point. So, I mean, hey, you know what? Props yeah. to Krause. Yeah, and it's, it's not... It's not too surprising either. You know, he's, he's had a, he's had a really good year. He's looked fast pretty much everywhere they've gone. Um, so it, I think it was a matter of finally putting races together and sealing the deal, and I think he's been able to do that very well. So and and looking at it, you know, Huddleston and Deegan are both just in their second year. You know, Krause is on his third year, and Jagger and Brittany Zamora are rookies. So if you look at Strictly by experience and by performance last season, um, I think Derek Krause should have been the favorite to win the title all along. So I think he, he's, he's definitely going to be deserving of that when he finally does clinch it. But that was K&N out at uh, Roseville and Bill McAnally Racing out of Roseville, California. It's their home track. So they couldn't get the home win this year, but still a good showing for them. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to... Uh, seeing what comes of a lot of these young racers' careers. I think a lot of them have a bright future. Anyway. So, yeah, t- let's get into... Well, let's start with the truck race. Yeah. Um, let's start with that because the yellow line controversy came back. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, Ross Chastain, who, of course, you've been following the whole Melon Man Challenge thing this year, uh, switched his declaration in points from the Xfinity Series to Truck Series midseason, won a few races, got into the playoffs... Uh, he was leading at Talladega and pulling off some uh, aggressive blocks, and ultimately one of them was ill-advised, and he got turned in front of the field. So, I mean, Chase, I think I know where you stand on this because you're a fan of aggressive racing. How, how do you feel about blocking at I mean, super speedways? Because the way I see it is, you know, like I'm I'm a Chastain fan, obviously, but I do I do feel like the guy needs to calm down a little bit, you know, when but, it comes to these big play tracks. You know, for me, it's just like. The hard no racing, like, as long as you're not actively, like, causing an accident, I really don't care. Like, is, like, if you actively, like, intentionally go out of your way to make sure someone crashes, that's when I'm like, eh, you might need to tone it down just a little bit. But if you're just, you know, if you're blocking someone in and it's really just, you know, kind of a pain in the neck for everyone else, good. That's what racing's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be friendly with other racers. Like, oh, well, you're about to pass me. Well, here you go. You just have to be faster than me. I'm going to put it to the pedal to the metal, but you, you know, you know, if you're faster than me, good on you. No. <laughs> you can, no. If you're going to try and pass me, I'm going to get in your way. And you know what? If you're going to pass me, you're going to dang well earn it. So, I mean, I no. th- I thought it was fine, but, you know. Well, I want to I wanna show you guys uh, the clip of the crash. Um, and I want you guys to listen to... The Fox Sports coverage again. I, this is this has been a common theme, um, but I was uh, I was disappointed. Um, just everything from the booth, and I I I don't really have a problem with Vince Welch. You know, Vince Welch is a good guy, um, and he's great on pit road. In the pits, he's great. Um, I I think he he's very knowledgeable. He knows his stuff. Um, but as you're about to see with the clip we're gonna play, uh, he just shows no emotion whatsoever when he's doing play-by-play take a listen to this a lot of energy in this pack there's brett moffett in the 20 there it goes oh and there's a collection into the wall and through the grass on the bottom i would be shocked if it weren't ross chastain and there he is 
<laughs> was that like it's, a that that? For, I can't it tell. If that's, me of, it reminds me of Joe Buck during the David Tyree catch in the Super Bowl. Like this is perhaps the championship favorite. One of I, I would say with Brett Moffat, probably one of two championship favorites. I can't tell. Beating the race, the big one at Talladega spins in front of the pack, and you can't see it if you're just listening. But the camera work didn't even cut. I mean, they were showing the middle of the pack, and it took them forever to cut out and show the wreck. And then Vince Welch is just like, oh, there's a you know, five second pause collection of trucks in the infield. Like, that's the best you can do? Seriously? Like, this is why I want to get to sports broadcasting. Because if you have a bad sports broadcaster where it's just like, oh, hey, look, you know, uh, Jimmy Johnson's about to pass uh, Joey Logano for what could potentially be, you know, the championship right here. This is really good racing, folks. Get excited. Get emotional. Like, be enthusiastic. But nope, it's just there's a I, I, I couldn't tell if he was you know, uh, commentating a NASCAR race or a lawn darts tournament. Like, seriously, like. Like, dude, have some passion for the love of all that is holy. Okay, this is, that's the end of my rant because, I mean, I'm probably going to go into sports broadcasting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah nope, uh, no, I just <sighs> – and like I said, you know, I have no problem with him in the pits. But this this is – and this this is not – It's a, I, would, um, I would say I'm surprised, but I'm not. It's a collection like it's... of um, mistakes <laughs> yeah. made when uh, talking about this wreck. And um, it's – oh, wow, it's just – it's terrible, you know, like wailing and gnashing of teeth, you know, an infant crying yeah. in the stands. Well, like... and, and, you know, I hear people, people complain that Dale Jr. gets too excited in the booth for NBC. And I'm like, you know what? Frankly, I'll take that over the stone cold lack of emotion that we see sometimes out of the Fox booth for the truck races. I mean, <laughs> like, you can just tell he's just like, I'm just doing this to get a paycheck. And it drives me crazy. It's just the it's collection Steel <laughs> and rubber and gasoline yep. <laughs> moving very yeah, fast. Pretty much. It's, it's very fast. <laughs> like I can't like I feel like I feel like Will Smith trying to comment like or not Will Smith, um Will Farrell commenting this as a joke would be more entertaining than listening to this. Cause I feel like it'd essentially be the same thing, but at least Will Farrell would be funny about it. Like Yeah. I mean heck, even Will Smith. I don't even know yeah. if Will Smith is a racing fan. I'm pretty sure he would just be like, uh, he, was, ah, he was hanging that's out. Hot. Sorry. He was hanging out with Lewis Hamilton at a uh, Abu Dhabi last year. So I don't I don't know how what he what he thinks of NASCAR, but he's he's buddies with Lewis, so <laughs> eh, it might be but, worth it. But yeah, uh after that, we got to the finish and Yellow line controversy came back, as I mentioned. Uh, Johnny Sauter was leading the race. Uh, Riley Herbst was in second, had a run on him, coming to the checkered flag through the tri-oval. And Sauter forced Herbst below the yellow line, went below the yellow line himself, but never lost the lead. Uh, The rule is that if you advance your position below the yellow line, you may be penalized. Not you will be penalized, you may be penalized, which is a gray area in and of itself. Spencer Boyd was running in third for Young's Motorsports, a relatively small team. Ended up passing Herbst, didn't pass Sauter. Sauter crossed the finish line first, but they gave the win to Spencer Boyd. If you can't tell, I'm having an internal screaming fit right now. This is such a stupid rule. Like, seriously, if you don't want people to cross the yellow line... Put a freaking wall there. <laughs> or better yet, a patch of grass where if they crash in or if they start going on there, guess what? You're going to probably do a yeah, flip that's or all, like that's, burn out. That's it always, doesn't make sense. That's always the argument for track limits is, you know, on road courses, you know, you, you see with Watkins Glen, you know, they paved over all the gravel traps and everything because they thought pavement would be a little bit safer, I guess. Um, ideally, the gravel traps were put there to slow the cars down, but times have changed, so I don't know if they just thought they could pave over them or if there were new safety concerns with the I gravel, mean, but... I mean, if honestly, if a car's spitting up gravel, it's like a bullet, so I can kind of see it. Well, but, I mean, yeah. then again... But, they... Well, what for whatever reason, um, it's pavement now. So you see at Watkins Glen going through turn one, the cars... I mean, if it were an F1 race, every car would be given a five-second penalty every lap for uh, leaving the track and gaining an advantage. But NASCAR has no track limits rules, so... That's not a problem, but people always say, you know, if, if you don't want drivers using it, don't pave it, yeah. <laughs> and, and and your problem is solved there. It 
And I kind of feel the same way about this yellow line rule. You know, it's it's only a rule at Daytona and Talladega, and and you see, at mile and a half, like like uh, like Kansas or two mile tracks like Michigan and and Fontana, you'll see drivers actually use the apron as part of the racing line, um, especially in qualifying because you know if you cut the tri oval down to as close as you can get, um, you know it's a shorter way around the track. Ideally, if it saves you a little bit of time, yeah, you know. Why why are there only two tracks on the schedule where, where we have a rule like this? I mean... Especially I, when it's so controversial and affects the outcome of the race. I don't understand it because every other sport, there's something like that. I mean, I know how you feel about stick and ball sports, so I'm not going to go there. But track and field. In the college level, they actually have a metal rim around the track because, um, you know, with the steeplechase, it's very easy to kind of go on to the, in, in the inwards of the track. And people use it. It cuts off a couple, you know potentially like a second if you do it, you know, on both the turns. But they put a barrier there so honestly people aren't cutting in. So what I don't get is why don't why doesn't NASCAR do something like that where if you don't want people going there, put a barrier there. Put grass, put gravel, I mean, heck, put a bunch of screaming fans. I don't care. Well, preferably not well, the fans. That's a lawsuit waiting yeah, to happen, no, not but the, not the fans. <laughs> if if somebody wrecks, you know what? Hey, you know what? If you want a good experience, thousand dollars, you could be right <laughs> no. up in front. It could kill you. It's that good of an experience. I mean, like, but no, I, put a barrier there. Get rid of the yellow line rule. It's like that, or let them use it, because you know, yeah, it's I you agree. know, like Ben said earlier, if you don't want drivers going on it, don't pave it. I don't. I. Yeah. I if you you got to move on to the next topic, yeah. I'm gonna keep screaming well, about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Congrats to Spencer Boyd on the win. Um, I've got nothing against Spencer Boyd. I know some people do. They, they thought him uh, sitting out of race with back problems this year was a little bit suspicious um, or think he races too aggressively or whatever it is. But I've got no problems with the guy or Johnny Sauter. Um, but if you ask me, Johnny Sauter won the race. So that's that's my opinion on that. But then we get to the cup race at Talladega, and the rule came back again. Uh, well, We'll get into that in a second here, but <laughs> it was a it was a pretty good race, I'd say. I don't know if you got a chance to watch it. Um, it actually got delayed. They did the first stage on Sunday, and then rain came in, and Talladega doesn't have lights, which, you know, it, as much as I get on like Dover's case because Dover's so small, you know, Talladega is over two and a half miles, so I, I get it. It's an expensive project. Um, that being said, they did just do some massive renovations there, and. They didn't add lights, so I think a night race in Talladega would be pretty cool, but it would also be very expensive to put together. So, because you know, I understand money, it. Yeah. Something NASCAR doesn't have a lot of right now. Yeah, so that's a bit of a problem. But yeah, uh, it just—I don't know. I, I don't like. Pl- I used to love play racing because it was uh, it was an opportunity for the underdogs and and everything, and I still like it for that reason. Um, but you know, as I've grown and matured, I I come to appreciate. Uh, the fact that, you know, there, we we really were bankrupting teams, uh, some of the smaller teams at least, or we risk doing that with, with what we do at these places because, you know, just the, the amount of... I think people even tweeted after the race, you know, we need to get rid of the phrase, the big one, uh, which is, you know, the big accident that happens at Daytona or Talladega because you're racing in a pack and... We need to, we need to start saying oh that was a big one because there's usually more than one multi car accident per race there yeah. and you just you see all these budgets go up and literally in smoke and yeah. for the smaller teams in particular it just it's really crippling. really hurts yeah um, so speaking of small teams Brendan Gone and Beard Oil Motorsports uh, team that only runs the four races at uh, the plate tracks or Super speedways. I keep saying play tracks. I know we're using taper spacers now, but you know, and I, I'm still not used to that. Um, <laughs> Clearly, they're uh, yeah. They they were only running two races at Daytona, two races at Talladega. They were up all the way to second. They were getting a big push from cars behind them. Brendan gone even thanked Brad Keselowski uh, in his interview after the race, but he was in a spectacular crash. Really, probably one of the scariest flips I've ever seen live. Uh, Austin Dillon's crash at Daytona four years ago in the July race there was probably uh, right up there with it, um, at least speaking in terms of NASCAR. But in six right. laps to go, too, that's probably the worst part of it. Yeah. You were so close to the finish, and then you just flip like that. It, uh... Yeah. He stuck the landing, though. 
it is, like, the roof of the car never hit the track, so that was something. Um, I mean, get on the he, engineers not that he has on that any part if they had that, something to but, do with that, but yeah. But yeah, that was uh, probably the most memorable moment of the race. Um, and also, NBC twice was was on board with a driver. Um, just happened to be on board with Bubba Wallace and Joey Logano when they happened to wreck, um, which which is very rare. You know, it's it's an odd coincidence to see that, but I think it was. It was cool for fans to see that perspective, you know, because Joey Logano's just going along and all of a sudden we're all startled because suddenly he's spinning and, you know, the car's catching a little bit of air, it didn't flip, but, you know, that's how quickly things can change because he had gotten tagged uh, in the back and ended up getting spun out and you would you would never see that coming you would never expect that so it's it's it was cool for the fans to get to see that from the driver's perspective obviously not cool that a bunch of cars got torn up but yeah i mean I, i'm always down for looking at things new way and seeing something like this happen it's like it kind of just gives you an idea of you know how dangerous motorsports can be made me think oh. but yeah so we get to the finish and Again, similar situation. Uh, Ryan Newman's leading. He had a big lead coming out of turn four, and that's actually when I knew he was in trouble because I knew the pack was going to get a huge run on him. Um, Ryan Blaney had a run, one to the inside. And again, Newman kind of, I mean, it wasn't as egregious as Sauter's block was, but Newman kind of, you know, made a move to the left and kind of forced Blaney below the double yellow line. Um, they came back out onto the racing surface, and Blaney... And I mean, you you could you could say that Blaney made the pass below the double yellow line, um, which might be a penalty, but it was a photo finish, seven thousandths of a second, one of the closest finishes ever in uh, in NASCAR history. But yeah, he made the pass below the double yellow line, and they looked at it, but they reviewed it and said, "Nah, you're all good." Uh, Blaney's the winner, and Newman is second, and they both get to keep their positions. So. Regan Smith went on Twitter after the race and said, huh, I guess we have new rules, because, of course, he's referring to the 2008 race there where Tony Stewart was in Newman's position and he was in Blaney's position. He passed Stewart below the double yellow line after being forced down there, and NASCAR said, uh, sorry, Regan, but you're going to go back to 18th. Last car in the lead lap. Tony Stewart won the race, even though he crossed the line second. I don't... And this is why I believe we should just get rid of the rule, because in a perfect world, I guess we would uh, use consistency... And be consistent with our judgment calls, but NASCAR. I mean, we saw at the Roval, NASCAR and consistency don't always uh, mesh too well. So I would just say abolish the rule. I think it would save people a lot of problems. Normally, I debate, but I have no arguments to give for the other side. Yeah, just get rid of the rule. Just get rid of it. Yep. Yep. And uh, Steve Letard actually dug up an old tweet from Jeff Gordon from, I guess, a year and a half ago. And Jeff Gordon was basically saying, well, here's a clip of somebody who was blocking and the double yellow line rule. This is what happens when you don't have it because it's set of a multi-car accident. And Steve Lutar basically said, yeah, I agree. And then Dale Jr. said, I think I disagree with both of you. But I'm on the latter side because, okay, you know, maybe it, maybe it would have prevented that accident there. But, like, we still see multiple big accidents almost every race. So, you know, if it's if if you have the rule, you have a big wreck. If you don't have the rule, you have a big wreck. Like what's what's changing there? I mean, you, you get rid of the controversy if you if you don't have the rule. So, I would just remove it. I don't know. I guess you don't have any extra thoughts on that because you agree 100%. Pretty much. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Normally I'm not one to agree so easily, but honestly, I'm just I get get rid of it. Get yeah. rid of it. Yep. And uh, I, I want to talk briefly uh, about, and we want to get into the BF1 stuff briefly as well, but uh, Chevrolet actually called their drivers into a meeting during the rain delay and said, you guys will work in the draft together, and if you don't, if you work with a Ford or a Toyota, there are going to be consequences. Hello. So <laughs> Not Chevy's talking about team orders, and anytime you mention team orders in racing, it's highly controversial. Um now, obviously, with the nature of racing at Daytona, Talladega, you need partners in the draft. You need to work together in many respects. Um, and I get why manufacturers would want all their drivers to work with each other rather than, you know, a Chevy working with a Ford or a Toyota working with a Chevy or whoever. But 
can we really be threatening consequences to drivers who maybe not even intentionally uh just just it's late in the race they find themselves you know your friends are where you find them you've got to go you know if, if it's a chevy driver great but if not you know c- can you put, hold that against them i mean i would much rather have a win and people kind of scattered throughout the lower mid pack than well i mean at least my guys were middle of the pack but you didn't win so what's the point no um, and they didn't win it was a bunch of four guys up front four took the top at least the top three spots off so remembering off the top of my head i have to go back and look at the results yeah it didn't work they didn't win the race so it's bad call by the own or bad call it cost you and i mean like yeah i can understand where it's like you know we want our guys to work together to be that much better but if you're not going to get results by that way you might have to let the drivers just be individuals so yeah okay yeah i guess i thought omarola was third but hamlin ended up getting third austin dylan was sixth that was the highest finishing chevrolet driver so that's uh, that's minimum because there was a Toyota in front of him. That's minimum manufacturer points for Chevy in that championship. So, not totally good. backfired. Yep. Well, speaking of championships, uh, Japanese Grand Prix over in F1 as we close off with the final five minutes of the show or, or so here. Um, Valtteri Bottas got the win. Mercedes clinched for constructors championship and they clinched for drivers championship because at this point it's either going to be Hamilton or Bottas. I say that it's really going to be Hamilton. It's just a matter of when, not if he clinches the title. So for the sixth year in a row, Mercedes are both drivers and constructors champions. I was like, good yeah. for Mercedes. Uh, good on them. Like really. Yeah. I mean, I, I respect it. You know, I'm, I, I've grown up a Ferrari fan and, I was a Mark Webber fan for a while, um, and then he retired. I was like, well, I guess I'll start rooting for his teammates. So I rooted for Vettel. Of course, he moved to Ferrari. I've always loved Ferrari. I've um, always loved Michael Schumacher. So I've been a Ferrari fan for a long time, but you know, I, I came in here actually last night to record my other podcast, and I, I had a Mercedes Polo on, um, which I it's a funny story. I bought that uh, thinking I was going to do a Com Arts project with that last year. I ended up scrapping the idea, but... I do own the Mercedes Polo. I figured if there was ever an appropriate time to bring it out, it was for the Monday after the race. So, yeah. Props but, to them, really. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't... You can like Hamilton, you can hate Hamilton, you can like Mercedes, you can hate their dominance and their dynasty, the fact that they win all the time, but you can't help but admire what they've done. It's, it's one of the greatest dynasties in motorsports history. I mean, I think it's one of the greatest, greatest dynasty in sports history. I mean, I think the only one that can potentially come close is the New England Patriots. But Well, they've got six total. Yeah, I like, know. Th- These guys won six in a row. I know. Like, that's yeah. why I said they're the only ones I think can come close. Yeah. So, I mean, but again, like, you can't just hate them because they're good. You actually have to have another reason. I feel like a lot of people yeah. just hate them because they're good. Well, it doesn't hurt that Ferrari tend to implode, and they imploded again. Um, they... Shocker. Yeah. Uh, Charles Leclerc had a bit of a run-in and damaged car and caused some controversy. And uh, Sebastian Vettel didn't get off the line very well, actually. I guess he, I guess you could say he jumped the start, but then he hesitated and then he won again. So I guess the stewards thought that that was enough of a penalty. Like, he didn't gain an advantage by doing that. So, But he blew the start. So then it was uh, Mercedes kind of home free as they've been so many times in recent years. I do want to give a shout-out to Alex Albon, um, the driver from Thailand, who, of course, replaced Pierre Gasly in the Red Bull midseason this year, got his best career finish from a team so far in fourth, so he's knocking on the door of a podium, which Gasly never got one of those this year. So, you know, Props to him, really. Yeah. It, yeah, Albon's looking good. How old is Albon? Uh, early 20s, I think. It's impressive that he's able to do that at such a young age. Yeah, well, and Leclerc, too. I mean, they're all, like, Alba, yeah, Albon's 23. Um, <laughs> Yikes, he could be a senior at Gordon. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. If you look at what Verstappen did, I mean, Verstappen won a race at 18. So there's a lot of young blood uh, in that Contrary series Contrary to popular right now, belief, but... motorsports is not dead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. yeah, uh, that's going to pretty much wrap it up for this week's show. I hope you all enjoyed hearing the story of a, uh, What's left of Nazareth Speedway firsthand, and us recapping the uh, the racing action last week. Uh, next week, NASCAR heads to Kansas, and it's a cutoff race for the playoffs. So Kyle Larson and Ryan Blaney are breathing easy, and uh, some other guys are 
all butt locked in on points. Everybody else, it's uh, it's tense times down in NASCAR garage. So, it's gonna be sweating bullets. It's gonna be a good race. So, yep. And uh, we'll see if we have a guest on next week or not. But I guess you'll find out uh, in a week's time. But until then, for Chase Strauss, I'm Ben Schneider. We'll see you next time. Have a good night, everybody. Peace.